This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. everyone. It is Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by the free One for the Week email newsletter. One for the Week delivers one high-impact communication resource to inboxes each week that you can apply immediately to take your communication skills to the next level. If you want one piece of communication and persuasion insight that you can put to use right away to get your voice heard, more effectively lead your team, or advance your organization's priorities, Join the 800 subscribers of the One for the Week newsletter by going to whensciencespeaks.com backslash one for the week. That's whensciencespeaks.com backslash one for the week. I am so pleased to have Dr. Alessandra Zanari on the show today. Dr. Zanari is co-founder and chief scientific officer of One Skin, a groundbreaking skin company on a mission to create technologies that help people age in a healthy and vibrant way. She earned her master's degree in stem cell biology and her PhD in skin regeneration and tissue engineering at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil in collaboration with the Three Bs Research Group in Portugal. Alessandra did a second postdoctoral at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. She is also co-inventor of three patents and has published 20 peer-reviewed papers in scientific journals. Welcome to the show, Alessandra. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Mark, for having me here. I'm very excited for this conversation. Same here. And I just want to share with listeners how this conversation came to be. So I reached out to Alessandra and her team because I was using one of OneSkin's products. And I was not just happy with it and seeing results, but I also was intrigued by the way she and her other co-founders and team were explaining the science that was underlying their work. And then as I dug a little deeper and I saw some videos and the patents and other things like that and how the company was just doing a very good job of explaining complicated science, I thought it would be a perfect fit for Alessandra to come on the show. And thankfully, she was able to make time in her busy schedule as a startup entrepreneur, co-founder, scientist to talk to us all today. So I just wanted to give listeners a little bit of a backstory that I actually used it today, by the way. And uh, it's been great. And so we are going to get a chance to talk more about that. But first, let's get to know Alessandra a little bit. As I mentioned, went to school in Brazil, originally from Brazil. And Alessandra, as you were growing up, how did you first get interested in science? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for the opportunity for telling a little bit about the story of One Skin and my story as well. So as you mentioned, I'm from Brazil. I was born in a very small city in Brazil called Teoflotone. And I was born there because my father, his job ended being there. So he and my mom moved there. So we were a small family in this town. And also when I was growing up, I also saw I was far from my grandparents and the rest of the family. And very interesting because the way my father raised me and my sister, because he lost his father when he was 13 years old, he always, since we were a kid, he brought up that maybe he wouldn't be here forever. So for us to have the knowledge that he didn't know until when he would be around, so we would need to be prepared and we need to study a lot and be aware and be ready if he's not around anymore. And that idea that I will lose my parents was always a little bit scary for a kid. And when I was 10 years old, my grandfather from my mother's side, he passed and he lived far from us. I didn't see him that often, but I loved him so much. He had such a, a big impact on my childhood. And he had a cancer that in six months he was gone. And I was super sad. And I was thinking about my father also saying that he wouldn't be here forever. And I wanted, what can I do to have my family around for longer? 
And at that same year was the year that they were cloning on all news. When I was seeing the news, they were cloning Dolly, the ship. They were cloning the first mammal animal. And I, that I thought to myself, oh my God, maybe I can one day clone my family and they will <laughs> always be around. <laughs> I will not be, I don't need to be afraid of losing one day my dad. I, will, I can bring back my grandfather. And that sparked me the idea of going into science and this whole knowledge of not liking to see losing others for diseases mm. was what started bringing me. Maybe one day I can find the cure of a disease. Maybe one day I can work with something that will help me not lose my family. That was the first when I was still very young that made me science and as I was studying all my biology teachers, I was always very interested in cell biology and that's why I decided in college to continue researching and studying biology. So interesting and I want to ask you more about your career journey, specifically when you decided that you wanted to be an entrepreneur that early on your academic work or later and maybe others who might have influenced your thinking just with respect to embarking on an entrepreneurial career, for example. When I went to college, I had this notion that I wanted to do science, but it was still very obscure how I would get there if I would really be able to bring something into reality and it's some of the science. In college, I was already focused on which that was translational. When I started college, I was already completely passionate about the idea of working with stem cells and the potential of stem cells to differentiate into any cell type of your body mm. and be able to regenerate different tissues. So when I was in college, I looked for an internship in a lab that was in stem cells, was the only lab in my city in Belo Horizonte. I was in Belo Horizonte at the University of Minas Gerais. And I went to do an internship and I, was, I had already in mind, I want to do translational science. So... Inside me, I knew that I wanted to translate. I didn't know how would be the path that one day I would start the company. That was not clear. I knew that I, I needed to learn how to do science, so I would need to do a master and a PhD. So I started focus of, okay, I would need to understand how to do science. And I went to this group in Belo Horizonte and I started doing research on stem cells and learning how to differentiate the stem cells into other tissues. And I got fascinated about skin regeneration was when I went to a conference and I visit a skin bank in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So they were able to have cadaveric skin that they build meshes and they transplant this into burned patients. Mm -hmm. And this saves lives. But the problem was because the tissue was coming from another donor, after two weeks, your own body start rejecting that kind of mandate of mm -hmm. uh, skin. And you need to remove it and then this led your tissue to become more scar tissue than real no skin. So when I saw that was, I was finishing my master, I came back to my supervisor and I said, Professor Alfredo, I want to research something for skin regeneration, for getting better wound healing with less scars. And he was one of my big mentors in terms of science, this professor, because he always incentivized me to go after any idea, even if it's crazy or not, to test, to go to the lab and test. And when getting results from the lab, sometimes research, for those that already do research, they will understand what I'm saying, but it can be very frustrating because sure. you have a hypothesis, you, want, you go to the lab and you start testing, and a lot of times the results are opposite of what you're expecting, the experiment doesn't come out, you cannot understand. And that mentor, my supervisor, he was always listening that there is no negative result. There is just result that's not being correctly interpreted. So look better to the result. Don't care on what you wanted to see to the result. Try to extract what happened and try to learn from that. Go back to the lab, try it again, try different ideas and go step by step. He encouraged me a lot on the science research and I was always trying during the PhD to be building my projects. They were very translational, was building a 3D model that would be associated with stem cells to promote better wound healing. This was my PhD thesis that ended receiving an award of best thesis of my university. So I was getting already on the steps of, 
okay, I love doing this research, but still I had no idea how this translates to really, how this become a product. Can I shift to that? And even when I finished my PhD, I had not a clear idea. I still went for a postdoc in Portugal where I continue researching and learning different biomaterials to use different ways of associating with stem cells to promote wound healing. And at that point, when I was already in my postdoc that I was doing research for already eight years in total, if I count when I started my internship, my master, my PhD, I started to get a little bit frustrated. I was doing a lot of good research. I was learning a lot and I was being involved in different projects that was all very challenging, was teaching me a lot, but I was not seeing the next phase, what I would do next, how I will fulfill that desire of seeing science being translated. So still in Portugal, I tried to start a startup there that was using stem cells, but cell therapy, it's very regulated. It's hard to go to humans. So I have some, mm -hmm. had some colleagues that were veterinarians. So together we start a company that would provide stem cell treatment for dogs, cats, and horses. But we didn't know what we were doing. And at the beginning was everything super hard to get to the path of what was a startup and how you get funds and how you created this product. So basically we started the idea, but that never went very far. But I was already like, okay, I want to translate. And then eventually my friends from Brazil that also did PhD in the same lab that me, Carolina had just moved to San Francisco to join an accelerator program mm -hmm. where they were also wanting to translate some of the research into a product or into a company. And it was interesting because then she was starting this here. I was starting that company in Portugal, getting a little bit frustrated. And then after the program, they decided they would be focusing this new company on skin research. And then eventually she called me and she said to me, Alessandra, uh, I'm here in San Francisco. I have some ideas on understanding skin aging and validating efficacy of product. And I cannot think of anyone better than you to come to join this project. We had no guarantee of what we were doing or where we would go, but there was a new opportunity there for me. And I just said, okay, I'm packing, I'm moving to the U.S. Let's start this company. Let's see where we can go. I love that story and the courage that you had to do that, to take that leap. Do you have, do you have PhDs, any scientists in your immediate family? No, I'm the first one, PhD first scientist. One. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because we were talking earlier, I have found that the people who are most skilled at science communication, at least to start, those who are first generation college or PhDs in their families and or bilingual. So it's funny that I was drawn to your company, to OneSkin initially after I was using the product by looking at how it was explained. And then one of the co-founders who first-generation PhD and bilinguals. It's a double benefit. Really interesting. I want to talk about your research, actually, on skin regeneration and mm -hmm. tissue engineering, because it's fascinating. And maybe now would be a good time, since you just queued up how you and Carolina, perhaps others, got the company running. Tell us about the company, what the mission is, where things have gone from you hopping on that plane yeah. and coming to San Francisco. I can even make the connection of my PhD and the company, how we started. And it's interesting because when you start a company, you need to be open minded Things change. I was doing this research on skin regeneration, building 3D skin models, and the goal really was to promote a better wound healing. But in that process, I learned how to culture skin cells. I learned how to build 3D skin models. When I was on my postdoc also, I was helping on another project that was doing high throughput screening of microRNAs. So I started learning high throughput screening as well. And when I was learning all those skills, I had no idea that eventually I would use those skills in my own startup. But what I always tell myself and I tell others is doesn't matter, even if you are like, completely happy or unhappy with what you're doing at the moment, if you are lost a little bit of what path you would take, 
show up every day and try your best and learn what you have to learn because eventually what you learn, you can use later on. So when I was there in Portugal, a little bit frustrated, still doing research and not seeing how I would translate that to research, I was still showing up at the lab and learning things, new things. And those skills that, that I was learning there, eventually they were the ones needed to one skin. When, when I came to one skin, the first idea when Carolina called me was, let's build 3D skin models to understand the aging process and validate products that are on the market. So we had already the knowledge of building 3D models, but sometimes we use very young skins because it's easier to build 3D models of skin using young cells. So the goal now was, okay, let's understand the aging process because the products that are aimed to promote rejuvenation, they will be applied on a more mature skin. So we right. need to see the effect on this skin and what's the difference. So we started building this platform. One skin then, just to go back a little bit, one skin has always has the mission of target root causes of aging to promote skin health. So we are really looking to ways that we can connect the health of your skin with your overall health, promote a younger state of your skin, and that will result in a better appearance as well as you bring a product that's cosmetic, but with the goal that we will also help your whole body to be aging better. Mm -hmm. So we started with this platform. The first idea of One Skin was building this platform that understands skin age, understands the markers and validate products. And we were looking to different markers, aging markers, not only the typical markers of collagen production or let's say the symptoms of aging. We were going deeper. What is causing that process on the, on the skin? And then we just, by doing that and first thinking that we would be a company that provides service to others, we realized that there was no product that was targeting what's causing aging and how this connection of the skin with your overall health. So then again, that knowledge that I had of high throughput screening came here and then we started, okay, let's screen for molecules that can target those damaged cells that, that accumulate with aging. And that allow us to identify a new molecule that we were seeing that when we treat aged skin, was able to decrease the markers of aging, was able to decrease the inflammation. And as a consequence, the young cells of the tissue were producing more collagen, you were getting a thicker epiderm, and you were getting a more healthy state of skin. And then we were a team of researchers in the beginning of the company, and the goal was to have this platform to be validating, finding molecules and licensing molecules to the market. Mm -hmm. And then we found this molecule that was outperforming all other molecules. That, and when we were seeing the difficult that it is to communicate, to talk to big companies, you were still too small to understand the value of this new molecule that we are showing. We saw, okay, this will be a long process. Maybe we will be able to license a molecule and who knows if they will use or not this molecule. We're also so interested on this communication on how your skin impacts your overall health. So why instead of just continue trying to license and finding molecules, why don't we create a product? I still remember the day that we made that decision was end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And we said, yeah, let's do the product. Let's formulate this. Let's create a brand. We will start selling this. We'll go to people's and that early dream that I share with my co-founders as well of being able to remove, to take from the bench to outside the bench. Our research was just, okay, now we have this opportunity. Let's do it. We had yeah. no idea of the big challenge we were going through, but we were so excited about the idea. The results in the lab were so good. That encouraged us to move on. I want to ask you a little bit more about that. So where were you all when you decided to do this? Were you all in one place? Were you in the lab when that big light bulb went off? We were exactly in this room that I am now. <laughs> that is a meeting room. So once again, our lab space, it's in co-working for biotech. So we rent our lab space and we have meeting rooms, we have desk and we have equipment and lab and so on. So we are here since 2017 and we were in a meeting with Toki 
And then we decided, okay, this is our new goal. We are going to create a product. Let's start moving to the next steps. We had no idea. We had good results working in skin samples, our models in vitro. Mm -hmm. We had no idea if we were able to transform this molecule into a cream that would penetrate the skin. And if that happened, would you see benefits? Would that have benefits even on the appearance of the skin? We didn't know, but we were excited to try. Yeah, that is just so electrifying, that outcome. Let me ask you this, because it's evident from the way that One Skin explains the science of skin aging and your passion comes through the energy that you have to talk about it. And of course, working on it for years and years. When you're talking about the skin microbiome and how the topical supplement works, you're doing this in really accessible, clear, engaging ways. As chief scientific officer that you are and one of the co-founders too, how have you developed your own science communication skills to really be able to distill and describe complicated processes? For example, when you're talking about One Skin's products to people who haven't been at the bench and done all this experimentation over years and years, you have so much knowledge that you potentially could talk about, but you're still able to just pinpoint those things that are most important, most relevant, and describe them in accessible ways. So how would you describe that process that you've been able to develop? I would say that's still a challenge. It is super hard because especially when you're passionate as I am about the science, I always tend to go into too many details. And then when we start to having to communicate this to others, it, at the beginning, I was going very deep on the details. And then I was uh, seeing on people's face that they were not understanding what I was saying. So the first thing I feel to start developing that skill is just talk to people that has no science background. Does they understand what you're saying? If they're not understanding, you need to to clarify your message. And then it was hard for me because when I simplify the message and I don't give all the details, it feels that I'm not giving all the science that is there. I always had that challenge with me because I wanted to explain more, but at the end, we need first to educate and have the interest of people. So we need to get simple, even though I don't say all the science, I need to be able to show the difference. For instance, we have developed an algorithm that in the beginning, I would say that measures epigenetic changes inside the cell through methylation profile, and it's able to determine and correlate with the chronological age of the skin. And I say that no one understands. But if I just tell you that we have an algorithm that's able to measure the real biological age of your DNA, and then I can tell you by measuring the biological age of a product that's really rejuvenating, reducing the biological age of the skin, now people can understand and get interested about it. And a lot of that comes from speaking and talking with non-scientists and also talking to people that already have experience on more copywriting and communication. And together you can help. We had several documents where we write what is the science and now let's cut all this epigenetic methylation and let's simplify the message. And we focus a lot on educational content on our Instagram and all on our website. There is a blog section where we talk a lot about science and I still struggle a little bit with that. I'm still in the learning process, but we are always trying the best. Right. And it is difficult. It's really yeah. hard to do. There's so much information and it is an iterative process. So the more you're doing this, the better you're getting at it. And then, of course, you're seeing the reaction of people. They actually do get what you're talking about rather than when you're talking using these scientific terms and they're just bewildered because it's the first yeah. time they're hearing that. Alessandro, let me ask you if you think actually being bilingual helps you be bilingual in the figurative sense, being able to talk to general audiences and also your fellow scientists. I think that being bilingual, it's also a challenge. I'm here in the U.S. speaking my non-native language. So I have a double challenge, not only of communicating what I need to communicate, but also being clear because I have an accent. This is not my first language, so I make sometimes some mistakes. So I feel that needing to talk on a non-native language, it builds another level on my side of needing to think better which words I will use. It's a challenge for me, 
that for others that are already native English speakers, they would not have that much of that challenge of thinking about pronunciation and being a little bit ashamed in the beginning of speaking English when you don't know how to speak so well. If you're already native English speaker, I think this is a good advantage. When you're bilingual, yes, you're accessing ways of speaking that you need to think more carefully. This can be helpful, but this is also a challenge to be communicating on not your native language. Really interesting and so true. Let me ask you, many listeners are interested in entrepreneurship, but they don't really have an idea of what it's all about, what it's to start a company or work for a startup. And understanding that there's no typical day in your work experience. I'm wondering if you could share some of the mainstays of your work schedule, things that you often see on your calendar as things that you need to do just to give listeners a sense about what it is to work for a startup or a startup company. For both sides, if you're working for a startup or if you're starting your company, you need to know that you will be wearing several hats. But to be very honest, in the very beginning, a lot of the daily basic tasks will be very similar to what you were doing in the academia. You will still be working in a lab doing the research. So the part of research, it's very similar to the academia. What it adds, it adds other layers. So the research usually in the startup environment is more focused. So you have very clear objectives that you need to respond. You're doing experiments, looking to proof of concept and looking more objectively, while when you're in academia, if you do one experiment and something show up, you just start digging and you just go to a completely different project and that's not a problem because you're just reaching and learning. So this is a big difference, but on the beginning, the daily base inside the research lab, it's very similar. What it changed then, like when you're starting a company is that you have other tasks as well pitching your company all the time to investors. You are also hiring new employees. In the beginning, for the first three years, one skin was only scientists. We were seven scientists doing research via this platform. When we start moving to create the product and create a brand, then now other pieces start to show up. I needed to start thinking about the communication, the content that we are creating to blogs to, or even Instagram, talking more to investors. And then eventually when you go to having a product in the market, you have operational sales and marketing and all different things. Today, as a chief scientific officer at OneSkin, I still lead the science that we are researching, the new research, the development of new products that we are doing at the company. I also do a lot of collaboration with the universities that are researching some of our active peptides that we have to other applications beyond the skin. I do a lot of work reviewing documents that share the data that we get in the lab to the marketing side. So it's accurate and being sure that anything that's going out there is very accurate on the science side. I lead with hiring process and also other fun things as well, because we have products. We are deciding which package will be the new product. So we have meetings with the designers. And for instance, today, some of the things that I will be doing, I'm recording this podcast now. Then I need to an analyze some data of a clinical study that we are running. I need to oversee the experiments that was run this week and check some that we'll do next week. Need to go over some documents of scientific communication and also using one of the packages and some things that are going for our next product. So it goes a little bit around several things. You need just, when you're in a startup, multitasking, it will be also very important to be able to wear different hats and being creative because not always you have funds to do everything on the perfect way. So we need to be very creative on how we can be different, how we can even do our research with the resource that we have available. Thank you for taking us inside your world for a little bit. Really cool. And I'm going to ask, other than time, having enough of it, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you've faced as you entered or operate in an entrepreneurial environment? There are a lot of challenges like uh, investors, especially in the very beginning, to fund your company is a big challenge. 
Another big challenge is hiring, growing that team of people that has the skills that also get passionate about your mission, your vision, and wants to take the risk to embark on this new company that has not many promise in the beginning. It's a challenge to find the best people in the beginning. Uh, and the other challenge that we faced was to generate the data when we had not much financial resource. So we need to be creative sometimes at the company. Yeah. yeah. Those are really steep challenges while you're doing all these other things. Yeah. At the same time. And OneSkin is getting ready to launch an exciting new product, actually. And I'm wondering if you can give listeners a sneak preview of what's in store. And also, we will have a special promo code for listeners of the show that they can use in the show notes that accompany the episode. We are very excited to launch it. It will be our first product. It's OS1i. So it's a product that has as an active ingredient the peptide that we discovered and developed here in the lab. And was specifically designed for the skin of your eye region. So we received skin samples from the eyelid leftover of plastic surgery. So we were using very specific eyelid skin to be testing and validating this formula to promote a better appearance, a, a more firm skin for a specific, like for this eye area. And we're very excited. We optimized the formula using our platform as well. We use our platform to test all the active ingredients that goes together with our peptide and in the final formula to ensure that there is no toxicity, there is no side effects that can be used in sensitive skin. And then we were able to do this specifically using skin from the eye area, which is something very new and unique. And this product is coming up at the end of this month. We are very excited about it. All right. So cool. Yeah. Listeners, look out for that and also the promotional code that you'll have as well to participate in a discount for this exciting new product. Alessandra, as we wrap up, you've mentioned a lot of critical information, taking us inside your day to day. I'm wondering if there is a piece of advice that you haven't mentioned, but maybe a piece of advice to another scientist who's thinking about entering an entrepreneurial environment, you're going to have to wear many hats and be flexible and be able to multitask, as you put it. And you gave us a, just a great series of different things, which can be really exciting to have all these different kinds of things. So you don't get bored just doing one thing all day, yeah. perhaps. But anything else, a budding entrepreneur, somebody who's thinking about it should know. Yeah, sure. To make the jump, going out of academia and jumping to start a company, you have two options. You can either join an early stage startup, or if you have an idea, or if you have already research coming from your PhD, you can start your own company. But I would say it's what we did a little bit was for starting to find accelerator programs that can help you on the start point. So we joined IndieBio. That it's an accelerated program specifically for biotech companies, specific for scientists that want to become entrepreneurs. So this is very helpful because there are mentorships. You meet different founders that are on the same stage as you, and you start creating this network. And a lot of times you learn with other founders how to do things, how to get out of the ground. My advice would be to try to find an accelerator program, uh, try to find people that complement your skills, that are also passionate about what you're looking or trying to solve. And there will be ups and downs. Don't give up on the first down. And always remember that you never fail because you're always learning something. And what you learn, no one will take out of you. So you will use this next. So just do the best. and. Good luck in any journey that anyone decides. Thanks so much for all of that. Really insightful and inspiring. Dr. Alessandra Zanari, co-founder and chief scientific officer of One Skin. You've given us all a lot to think about. Fantastic insight to be in the middle of this and really driving innovation in such an exciting area. So I really appreciate you taking time out from looking at the product and the results and the experiments and all these other things that are part of your responsibility to share your expertise and experience with listeners. Thank you so much, Mark. I love the conversation. I hope people also enjoy it. Thank you. You're welcome. And listeners, thank you for being aboard on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. 
Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com, and we'll see you next time.